Hey, how's it going? Welcome to episode 8 of Sound Editing for Visual Media. Today we're going to take a look at a sound design competition in which I was one of the winners. So we're going to break down my project and talk about some sound design. The goal was to sound design the video you are watching, but you were limited to a few audio files. Here are the rules for the competition. As you can see, you could do anything you want with the audio files, but you weren't allowed to add any other sounds as raw material. Now this is common practice in sound design competitions because otherwise people with bigger libraries would just have too much of an edge. It also makes things more interesting. Limited Limitation always breeds creativity and you will see by the end of this video that my limited palette of sounds really affected the way I treated this video in the end. Anyway, let's get started. Now there's a big difference between how you can approach a sound design competition versus a real life project. In sound design competitions, you don't have a boss. You are your own director, editor, mixer, everything. You are telling your own story and not someone else's. So our first pass of spotting has a different goal in mind. I'm trying to come up with a story. This is also one of the rules of this competition. When it comes to film sound, few people care how you design the sound or what fancy plugin you use. They care about the end result, namely how your sound work added to the story and vibe of the visuals. So that was our first pass. Hopefully you got some overall idea of what you want the story to be. Now, before we proceed and I show you some of my own ideas, if you want, watch the video one more time and just try to write down a few ideas about how you could approach telling this story and enhancing it with sound. If you're ready, we're gonna start in a moment. All right, so we're in some kind of a junkyard. There's this robot and it's, you know, you can see its parts. Suddenly it gets up sees its head missing, finds its head looking around, finds the rest of its body, puts itself back together. Oh, it's a cutesy little robot, waves to something, and a person comes and picks it up and takes it away. Very cute, right? So there are some hard effects that I just need to put on the track anyway, but let's listen to all the sounds that we have to work with. So I'm gonna bring up my work tracks. I'm gonna go to my Media Explorer where I have created a database from all the sounds I'm allowed to use. And I'm just gonna drag them in on a single track. Once we're in a single track, I'm gonna close my Media Explorer and I'm just gonna set all of them to a random color so that it's easy to see where a file ends and the other one begins. While we listen, I'm just gonna to switch to talking to you in text. So let's take a second to think about our story one more time while we watch the video again. It would be safe to guess that a lot of you thought, well, it's a cute intelligent robot assembling itself and being picked up by its owner. If you thought that, then you're like me and a majority of the some 4,000 sound designers that entered this competition. I listened to at least 300 of these submissions and a lot of them are the same. So when I heard that wind sound from earlier as well as some sounds of metal scraping, elevator doors closing. I found the general kind of creepy vibe in a lot of them and this gave me an idea. 
What if this is not a cute video? What if it's not cute that this robot was in pieces when it started? Like, who who tore the robot apart? What if it's like Toy Story 1 where that creepy kid is torturing robots and toys? What if the hand that takes the robot in the end is the hand of the very psychotic person who dismantled the robot to begin with so that it can tear him up again? All of this brings us to my first tip for entering sound design competitions. Throw away your first idea. As unique as you or I may think we are, chances are we're the same generation. We've grown up watching the same films, hearing the same sounds, associating the same things with the same objects through developing a collective film grammar. What this means is that 30 sound designers can watch the same video and have more or less the same ideas about it. Give them also the same sounds to work with and you're likely to get a lot of stuff that is basically the same. Now you may think you can set yourself apart telling the same story just by your sound design skills, but think of the judges. They're gonna be hearing 4,000 submissions and after a while they all just start sounding the same. So if there's one thing I learned is that in any kind of remix or sound design or scoring competition, you need to set yourself apart from the hurt. Long story short, I figured if most people are doing something cute and I do something uber creepy, that may attract the attention of the judges and it clearly did. So let's watch what I came up with in the end and then we'll get into sound designing. So this is my project in its final form. And as you can see, I got tons of audio, tons of layering and notice the way I arranged them as well. Let's play one more time. So notice the way that I have arranged the items in my timeline. They cascade top to bottom and left to right, and each scene is contained within eight channels. The reason for this comes from how we mix films in a mixing theater. With any kind of mixing console, you usually have banks of eight faders that you can assign to eight tracks. This is because we have eight fingers that we can move faders with. We can't really move five per hand because of how our thumbs are stuck to the side. So we can't really have them all leveled at the same place and be comfortable. So we're really only using our four non-thumb fingers for mixing. Now I edited and mixed this video at home during COVID. So this wasn't an issue, but it's a good habit to develop nonetheless. And this also organizes my sound effects in neat batches per scene or per event in a scene, so mixing it would be easy as I can focus my mixer on 8 tracks at a time and not worry about a sound popping out of nowhere 16 tracks down the line somewhere. Also notice that my editing and mixing is item based entirely and not track based. Tracks in a sound design project, especially with sound effects, are just receptacles for sound. The same track could include many sounds that are very different in quality and character, so it doesn't make any sense for me to put plugins on the tracks. I can do all my automating and all my DSP by putting plugins and writing automation on individual items, and that way I can also move them around if need be. And if you were using Pro Tools, you had to audio suite these uh, plugins in, or you have to design your sound in a separate project and then bring it into this project. But with Reaper, I can put effects on items and I can change it down the line anytime I want. So it gives me more freedom to do reckless things with my sounds. And I know that it's always reversible easily. So one of the sounds we provided was this one. Let's listen to it. I thought this sound would make a great baseline for creating robotic movement sounds. Like when a robot moves in films and it goes However, all we have is one variation of the sound and you almost never want to repeat the same mechanical sound over and over again. When our brains process a sound effect, they are associating it with something they've heard. Like they hear a sound and go, oh, that was a door closing. But if you repeat that sound over and over again, suddenly our brains start to latch onto its other characteristics like its implied pitch, envelope, and timing. And it's just not natural and our brains can tell. So we need to create some variations out of this one sound. So I'm gonna drag a copy of this sound up to my sound design effects chain. And all it is is three tracks bust into each other. So the first track is two effects where we put our sound effects. It doesn't send to the parents and it just sends to our effects processing track, the track above it. And if I open that track, you see that it's got a lot of plugins on it. Now, not all of these plugins are used at the same time, but they are kind of the most common ones that are used quite often when sound designing. So it takes the sound from the track below it and it buses it to the track above it, which is my recording track. 
Now my recording track is set to record output in mono. I also have a stereo sound design track. And now I'm going to name this track based on the type of sound that I'm trying to record. So I'm recording servo sounds, so I'll name it servo sounds. Now I'm going to take the same file and I'm going to do some stuff to it. For sound effects, I like to use the sound touch algorithm at the high quality settings. And that's similar to like vary speed in Pro Tools. So it doesn't apply any kind of algorithm to the sound to preserve its pitch or its transient. It just slows it down or starts it up. I'm also going to unloop it so that I can drag its tail out. And then I'm going to just make a few copies of it, leaving a little bit of space between each copy. There are many ways of creating variety. Altering the pitch and play rate of a file is one of the easiest ones. So I'm going to do that to some of the copies, just kind of stretch them and shrink them a little bit. However, speed alone won't trick our brain. Our audio would still have the same contour, so we can still tell that it's just playing faster or slower. What we need is to create a lot of random variety in play rate, pitch, and even by stretching various bits of the file and leaving other bits alone and stuff like that, so it doesn't have the same contour and pitch throughout. Now, humans famously suck at creating randomness, and this also would take a lot of time, which is where something like the LKC variator comes in. This is a series of scripts and GUI that you can download for free. I'll put a link on it in the description as well as a video by the Reaper blog which explains it in more detail. But essentially once you download it you can run the script and you'll get this GUI. From here you can select a bunch of items and you can create variations in them based on a bunch of settings. So you can create variation in volume, pan, pitch, tape and stretching effects, rate, position, content, length and some other stuff. So for our intents and purposes I guess a little variety in volume is good. We don't need pan and pitch we definitely need some randomness taping and stretching yes please rate definitely with position no we don't really want it to change the position and then once we have all the settings we want to create we just go mutate and now we have a bunch of sounds that are kind of different in random ways based on how they're stretched where they're stretched from how their pitch and rate has been altered and other stuff you can also see why i created a tail for these sounds because i didn't want any of these sounds to go into each other once we manipulate their play rate and stuff like that so that each sound can play out in its entirety before the next sound occurs Next, I'm going to go to my FX track and I'm just going to do some basic EQing, some compression, some saturation and some stuff like that to give the sounds kind of like an even uniformness. Then I'm going to just start recording and I can already start manipulating the sound in different ways. I want to preserve the naturalness of the sound somewhat, so I'm not doing any crazy sound effect stuff. I'm just playing with my parameters as I go through and that creates also more randomness. Another thing I can do is that I can save subsets of my effects that are used for an application or another and I save those as effects change so that in later projects I can kind of refer to the same one. So if I ever am creating any kind of mechanical sounds, I can just load up this exact effects change. I'm also creating even more variation and I'm cutting out a lot of the silence, maybe making the last sounds a little faster so that I have faster sounds. Faster sounds are easier to layer and easier to put in sync with various movements, so that's nice. And now I'm going to stop and now we have a bunch of variations of the same sound. Now I need to dynamic split these items so I bring up the dynamic split menu and then here we don't need to split a transient, we just want to split them where the gate opens and where the gate closes. Then I'm going to just set the threshold, go through the file and make sure nothing is missing. There's one file missing so I can just adjust the minimum slice length to include that as well. I also want to create a leading path and a 100 millisecond trailing pad just to make sure we catch every bit of the sounds. I also will put a snap offset somewhere in the middle of the sound so that it's easier to put in sync down the line. I've explained snap offset in previous videos so watch those if you need to and that's how you get variation. So I also took the sound effect for the key drop, I reversed it and now I'm going to create some kind of like weird sound design -y thing for the intro. Since I've done this before I will just need to load that effects chain from when I did it during the competition and it's basically a bunch of ways of creating modulation in the sound using the Mondo Mod filter the Enigma filter and some pitch variation. I will explain these plugins in detail later down the line but I just want to show you that I can take the same sound and use modulation to make it sound kind of different, kind of synthetic and kind of appropriate for any kind of intro sequence. So once I'm satisfied with some of the variations I got, I can just stop recording. I'm going to take a little bit of it, go to the intro of my project, and I'm going to paste it here. I've already done this before, so I'll just show you a few of the sounds that I put in here and how they work in sync with the picture. So let's listen to this other sound. Pretty mundane sound. If I go to the item properties by pressing command and F2, I can see that it's recorded in 96K, which is nice, which means we can basically stretch it a bunch and it still makes sense. So let's hear it now stretched. And now let's reverse it. 
No, it sounds kind of interesting. What I can use this sound is to create kind of like a build up to a transition. So I got these two kind of impactful hits that uh, signify the transition. And that sound goes before them and kind of anticipates them. I think that sounds really good for creating that kind of transition from one scene to another scene in a very creepy way. Now this sound isn't really tied to anything other than to the scene change. So we really just want to create impact for when we arrive at this scene. Now basically the effect that this sound will have changes a lot based on where you put it. So if I just move this thing one frame this way or that way, it really changes the character of this transition. So normally when it comes to normal transitioning, we want to give a little bit of leeway to the video because for every frame of video in 24 frames per second, we have 2000 samples of audio to play with. So we have a little more leeway. We can let the video transition happen and then the audio transition can happen slightly later. However, when it comes to horror, I like putting my edit right on the cut. And the reason for that is that way it's scarier because you hear the sound, you see the visuals changing and it's a little bit like, whoa. And this is kind of the nature of every jump scare you've ever seen in any movie. So that sounds much better to me. This is also a good time to talk about a little bit of parallel processing when it comes to item-based editing. So the green files that you can see are both exactly the same file, but I have different effects on both of them. So on the first one, I have the low end boosted a little bit using this earth parameter. And I have a dynamic EQ in F6, which again is kind of boosting kind of the low end characteristics and a little bit around the 1K range. Finally, I have the OTT. And OTT is basically an upward and downward compressor in one, so it really just creates a lot of impact in the sound. So let's hear this layer on its own. It's really nice, it has a big high-end impact and a lot of creaks kind of at its tail. And then the bottom sound, it's the same sound, but it has a very different character. I have again the same uh, two plugins, different EQ curves on them. I also have Max Bass, which is an awesome plugin for sound design. MaxBase basically analyzes your audio's low end and synthesizes these really low frequency overtones based on its envelope. When our brain hears overtones of any sound, even if the fundamental is not present, our brain kind of extrapolates from what it hears and we perceive that sound existing. So MaxBase can give a lot of low end impact to any sound. So this is a good practice to parallel process the same audio file very differently and each layer of that sound gives a little bit of something to the overall character of the sound. Now layering is usually not done only with one sound, but we had a limited palette here. Normally I'd probably use this sound for its high end character and then have a separate audio file tasked with providing low end impact. Layering is crucial to make your sound design impactful and sophisticated. A single layer of sound is not really sound design. It's through creating layers and textures that we put our signature on any project. So just to recap, we took some very boring sound. We stretched it, we reversed it, turning it into this. And then we layered a bunch of sounds together to end up ultimately at this. And that's a pretty nice transition between one scene to another scene and it really sets the tone for the whole piece like this is this is gonna get creepy then we got like a headless robot getting up and these are mechanical sounds that i mostly got out of just taking the same sound changing the pitch and moving it around and automating its pitch and rate and envelope so that it works with the movement and again layers matter a lot so it's the second layer just a little more low endy scrapey sounds, more creepy. That's nice to me. It really kind of latches in once the thing settles. And some digital sounds. So I'm just kind of foley for it moving against the sand. They'll squeak. And together they sound like this. Now the whole scene. I really like this sound. This just came out of an accident because I forgot to turn the preserve pitch off and it just sounded really glitchy and that's exactly what I wanted. And the origin was just that fishing beeper sound. This one was just some normal pitch manipulation. Now I can go on and show you all of my sounds, but really I just wanted you to see that most of my sounds came from some very basic sound design technique, adjusting the pitch, adjusting the rate, reversing, and lots of experimentation overall. If you take 10 sounds and you create a thousand variations of them and just play with them and experiment, 
you will ultimately get at least 10 or 20 sounds that are really gold and really usable in everything. Add to that some basic editing techniques like do you put your transitions on frame perfect? Do you put on one frame late or one frame early? And those things really change the tone of the whole project as well. So this whole sequence of sound you just heard was all just reversing, just pitch shifting, really basic stuff. And it keeps the whole thing organic as well, which is really nice. So let's stop the video right here. We're already past the 20 minute mark. In the next video, I'm going to go deeper into some of the plugins I used and some other sound design techniques. And I also want to talk more about sampling and other tricks that are used to create the robust vocalizations, which I think is the strong suit of my project. Finally, we'll dive into mixing the project in stereo, which has been requested by multiple users so far. So stay tuned for that. As always, I left a lot of crucial detail for the blog post, which comes out tomorrow. So make sure to check that out. The link of that will be in the description as well. And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.